Hi, I'm Josh. Uh, so yeah, I'll be presenting our, our work on symbolic proofs for lattice-based cryptography. Uh, first, I should say a few words on what lattice-based cryptography is for people who don't know. Uh, for our purposes, lattice-based cryptography is a branch of crypto which uses vectors and matrices over Z mod Q as its basic building block. There exist other notions of lattices too for crypto, but I won't focus on them here. Of course, the biggest reason to be excited for lattice-based crypto is that in contrast to currently deployed crypto systems based on number theory, such as David Hellman or RSA, lattice-based crypto is thought to be resistant to quantum attacks. As post-quantum post crypto becomes more and more relevant, and particularly as the NIST standardiz standardization effort mentioned before proceeds on post-quantum crypto, lattice-based crypto becomes more important for the future every year. As lattice-based crypto becomes closer to real-world use in the next decade, it will also become important to provide tools to cryptographers to, mechan to mechanically verify the security of their cryptographic schemes. This is because of the possibility of flaws existing in security proofs, especially as the crypto systems be considered become more complex. However, the verification efforts applied to security proofs seen so far in the literature have not targeted lattice-based cryptography. Thus, we ask in this paper, how can we verify security proofs for lattice-based crypto? And hopefully, can we do so with some degree of automation? In this work, we will narrow scope to only consider encryption schemes based off of a specific hardness assumption called the learning with errors assumption, which I will now describe. The parameters of, this, of the learning with errors assumption are three integers, the modulus, the modulus Q and two integers N and M, which will be the dimensions of the matrices. Typically, N is considered the security parameter, and Q and M are then functions of M. How the assumption works is I first sample a uniformly random matrix A along with a secret vector of length n, s, shown here in blue, and an error vector of length m, shown here in red. This error vector is usually sampled from a discrete Gaussian. I then create noisy inner products of the columns of a with s by adding this vector e to the result. The LWE assumption, then, is, says that with appropriate parameter settings, no efficient adversary can distinguish between a scenario where I give it a, along with these noisy inner products, and a scenario where I give it uniformly random values. To see how we will verify security proofs which use this assumption, first let's look at the dual regf PKE scheme from 2008. To generate, to, to generate the public and secret keys, we first sample a uniform matrix A and a uniform bit vector R, and then set the public key to be the pair A, AR, which we call U, and the secret key to be this vector R. The message space of the scheme is single bits, so it is fine for now to generate this bit ourselves. Now we will encrypt this bit B by using the LWE assumption. In order to do so, we first generate a secret vector S along with these errors given by X0 and X1. Then treating this vector U just like another column of A, we generate a collection of noisy inner products of A and U against the secret vector S with the errors X0 and X1. This message, this message bit B appropriately scaled is then added to the noisy inner products corresponding to U. Finally, we give the public key along with these noisy inner products to the adversary, who will output a guess bit B prime. Our goal is to prove that the adversary cannot guess the value of B with probability much better than one half. To prove security, we want to apply the LWE assumption to this collection of noisy inner products in C0 and C1. We cannot do this directly, however, because there is a hidden correlation uh, between one of the columns, U, and the rest of the matrix A. This is why decryption works. So the first step of the proof is to erase the hidden correlation between A and U, which we can do so using something called the leftover hash lemma, which has them multiplying a random matrix A by a random bit matrix R, results in another random matrix close to uniform and independent from A. This result is also robust to a linear leakage of this bit matrix R by the vector W. Thus, we can apply the leftover hash lemma to this vector U to change to, change to a hybrid game where you sampled uniformely. After applying the L LHL, we are now in a situation where these noisy inner products are exactly as in the LWE assumption, so we may apply it and rewrite these noisy inner products to uniform. After applying the LWE assumption, we now have that the message bit is added to a uniformly random vector R1. By a technique known as optimistic sampling, we may safely erase the message bit for this uniformly random value. After doing so, we now have that the guess bit B prime is statistically independent from the guess bit B, so we are done. The point I want to make about this proof is about how we apply hardness assumptions and lemmas. Each major step of the proof, applying the LHL, the LWE assumption, or optimistic sampling, can be seen to be a single high-level rewrite of program expressions to take us from one hybrid to the next. How and where these rewrites happen is dictated by the hardness assumption or lemma. Crucially, all rewrites are expressed at the level of matrices, 
At no point do we refer to individual field elements of these matrices. This observation suggests a way for us to encode security proofs. We present a logic auto LWE for reasoning about lattice based crypto systems. This logic is based off of an earlier one, auto GNP, which was designed for group and pairing based schemes. The main feature of auto LWE and auto GNP is how they perform these security game rewrites, as mentioned before. Security games and hybrids are encoded using a simple probabilistic programming language, which has things like let bindings, sampling from distributions, sequencing, and most importantly, adversary calls in which the adversary has access to some given oracle, such as a decryption or a key generation oracle. When I execute a security game, I will receive a distribution on final program memories. There are three main judgments in auto LWE about these distributions. The first is that when I run a game G, some event E holds about the memory with probability at most epsilon. The second is similar, but talks about advantage rather than a success probability. The third is that two probabilistic events, E on G and E prime on G prime, happen with close probabilities. This is how we model hardness assumptions. In the paper, you can see how these judgments are used for simple program transformations, optimistic sampling, and so on. Now that I've told you about the core logic, I can tell you about how matrices are encoded in the system. We model matrices abstractly in a manner close to how they are used in real security proofs. The only way to create matrices in our system is through uninterpreted functions, uniform samplings, and the grammar we describe here. The arithmetic operations are standard and correspond to things like zero and identity matrix, matrix addition, multiplication, and negation. We additionally have a typing judgment which says that M is a matrix of dimension D by D prime. All of the arithmetic operations are then typed in the obvious way. In addition to the arithmetic operations, we also have structural operators. The first is matrix transposition, which behaves as you would expect. The others are horizontal concatenation, which puts two matrices side by side, and splitting, which recovers the left to right half from a concatenation. Concatenation and splitting are again designed to closely resemble real security proofs. Now I can describe how we may encode the learning with errors assumption in our logic. So here is our uh, hardness assumption. In order to describe distributions which are not uniform, we first think of the distribution as a deterministic function of a source of random coins. This can then be represented as an uninterpreted function. The reason this is fine to do is that in order to prove security, the only property we need about this error distribution is how it interacts with the hardest assumption and nothing else. Now, this line allows us to universally quantify over adversaries. The adversary takes an input a matrix along with a collection of noisy inner products or uniform and outputs a guess bit. Note that the second dimension of this first matrix is m plus one. This means that this matrix can be split into a left side of dimension n by m and a right side of dimension n by 1. This corresponds to the a and the u in this dual reg of security game. Now, when we state an assumption in the system, we had an axiom which says that for all adversaries which output bit b, the probability that b equals true in the first program is close to the probability that b equals true in the second. The first program gives the adversary a matrix along with noisy inner products, while the second program gives the adversary uniformly random values. In order to apply an assumption such as this one, suppose we have a security game G which involves a symbolic adversary A, and the event we wish to test is if some Boolean in G is true. Now, if the adversary has any oracles, these are just considered as part of the security game code. The first thing we will do is attempt to factor our, secure, our security game into two parts. The first part generates the matrix and noisy inner products from the LWE distribution. The second part, which is called the simulator, takes the adversary along with the output from the first part and outputs the Boolean B identically dis distributed as in this game G. The simulator will be a PPT adversary whenever A is, so we may plug the simulator into the hardness assumption, which allows us to replace the input of the simulator with uniformly random values, incurring some security loss coming from the hardness assumption. We may then unfold this transform simulator to get a new hybrid G prime in which the LWE samples are replaced with uniform. Given that we can do this factoring step, this technique for applying assumptions results in a highly automated, high-level method for proving cryptographic schemes secure. The resulting proof scripts, proof scripts closely resemble the proof one would write on paper. In many instances, the entire process of applying this assumption is given by a single line of code, such as the one here. Now, the question remains is how can we do this factoring? We need to rewrite the security game G into the following form. First, we run the program GSAMP, which will sample the inputs to the simulator. This program is actually de determined by it for us by the hardest assumption. Then we create a let binding PV, standing for public variables, which defines the input to the simulator. Then we have the code GSIM for the simulator. 
for the simulator to be well formed, it cannot access the variables in GSAMP directly, but only through this expression PV. Thus, we check that every expression inside of GSIM can be written only in terms of PV and any variables it generates itself. This means we have an induced side condition called deducibility, which we need to check. Given input expressions E1 through EN, deducibility asks if we can create the expression E targ out of the inputs. Or said differently, if there exists a context C, such that C of the inputs equals E targ. For matrices, after we do some pre-processing to deal with the structural operators, we have that this, pro this problem is equivalent to that of what's called subalgebra membership, which asks if I can add, subtract, scale, and multiply the input expressions to get the target. In the case of matrices where multiplication is non-commutative, this is solved by what's called the SAGB method, which is closely resembled, closely related to Grubner bases. In auto GNP, the corresponding deducibility problems for groups and fields were solved heuristically. In our work, we resolved this by proving that both problems are decidable by reducing the Grubner basis computations. This decidability result is in contrast to the algorithm for matrices, which is only proven semi-decidable. However, we don't consider this a problem because all deducibility problems we will find in our proofs will be very small. Now, I can tell you about some interesting challenges which occurred during our formalization of the security proofs that we see in the literature. The first scheme I will consider is a selective secure identity-based encryption scheme given in 2010. In the selective secure IBE scheme, the adversary first commits to a challenge identity ID star, and then the public parameters are generated. Here, three matrices A1, B, and U are generated at uniform, while A is generated from an algorithm trapgen, which outputs a matrix along with what's called a trapdoor for that matrix. The key property of trapgen is that the matrix that it generates A is generated close to uniform. While I cannot go through the entire security definition or proof for the scheme, what I will say is that the first step of the proof is to rewrite this uniform A1 from the public parameter into A times R minus H of ID star times B, where H is a publicly known function of identities to matrices. This has the effect of embedding the challenge identity into the silent ciphertext, which will allow us to prove the scheme secure. This transformation is cryptographically valid by raising in terms of the leftover hash lemma and optimistic sampling. There is an issue with this, however. Because A is sampled from trapgen instead of uniformly, we cannot directly apply the leftover hash lemma to the setting. In order to express our use of the leftover hash lemma here, we have to instead generalize the leftover hash lemma to the LHL composed with trapgen, which allows us to apply it to our proof. In this extended LHL, we sample A from trapgen instead of from uniform. We give both the matrix A along with the generated trapdoor T sub A to the adversary for the leftover hash lemma. This is somewhat counterintuitive, but turned out to be fine since the leftover hash lemma is a statement about statistical distance rather than computational distance. Now, my second example comes from a security proof from a CCA scheme. In this scheme, the public key is the pair A, AR, where A is uniform and R is a random bit matrix. Here, R is used as a secret key, which means it appears in the decryption oracle for the adversary. In the proof, we make the rewrite A of A times R to M of U times G minus AR, where U is generated during challenge encryption and G is a publicly known gadget matrix. Again, this can be argued to be sound due to the leftover hash limit and optimistic sampling. The issue here is that since R is used by itself in the decryption oracle, the factoring step of applying the leftover hash limit assumption will actually fail, because it is no longer true that all expressions in the simulator will be in terms of public variables. However, we should not be concerned about this, because giving the decryption oracle to the adversary does not give it enough information about R to violate the leftover hash limit. To model this use of the leftover hash limit, we introduce what we call oracle relative assumptions and relativize this rewrite to the decryption oracle. What this means in practice is that when we factor our security game in order to apply an assumption and check that an expression in the simulator is only a function of the expressions known to the simulator, uh, sorry, um, we may selectively disable this check for expressions found in the oracle. In order to express one of these oracle relative assumptions, the programmer must manually provide the oracle to the adversary in the assumption. Of course, the, advers the programmer could write down an assumption which is unsound relative to the given oracle. For now, it is the job of the programmer to verify that any relativized assumptions are still sound. In total, we give five main security proofs, one each for PKE, CCA, identity-based encryption, hierarchical identity-based encryption, and inner product encryption. All proofs given are small in size, about 100 lines of code, 
and fast to run. Each proof finishes checking in at most three seconds. In summary, we present a symbolic method to model lattice-based crypto systems. In order to do so effectively, we give principled solutions for the due disability problem based off of well-known techniques in computational algebra, as well as a generalized method to express lemmas and hardness assumptions relative to a given oracle. These extensions allow us in total to model five encryption schemes with various degrees of sophistication. All mechanized proofs are relatively short and fair to verify. I encourage you to check out our paper as well as our repository, which I list here. Thank you. Hi, can I ask uh, just a quick question? Um, so you applied this technique to analyze five schemes, but from your talk, it sounded like each time you had to analyze a new scheme, you had to modify your system. So, yeah. it, so in what sense is it automated? Uh, it is automated in the sense that when I apply one of these specialized um, uh, assumptions, uh, the, the game factoring step is actually done automatically. So uh, a, in many isn't cases. Isn't that only syntactic? Or, 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 or. Uh, it is a combination of a syntactic algorithm along with this deducibility problem, which is uh, induced. However, there exist uh, certain subcases where you have to do this factoring manually if the uh, tool does not. So, so that furthers the question, I guess, right? I mean, I'm just wondering, like, yeah. if I were to go to apply it to a sixth scheme, would it work or would it need further adjustments? Uh, there will be, always be uh, maybe some cases where you might need to do some kind of, give some kind of hints to the verifier, verifier but in many cases it will be automated in this, in this fashion. Hi. Um, can you apply what you've done directly? I mean, maybe this is to Jonathan's point, but can you apply this directly to... Um, Module LWE or Ring LWE. Yeah, so that's going back to the original matrices. Yeah, so that's something interesting to look at. We haven't actually looked at doing any kind of uh, more specialized LWE things, especially the kinds of things that you would actually see in a low-level implementation, like as in the NIST candidates. Uh, but this would be an interesting future direction. Okay, and and uh, writing one of these proofs is like is just as hard as like coming up with the real proof, right? Like you have to actually know how to prove it. Yes, but I would and argue just verifies that verifies it. Okay. Yes, but I would argue that in a lot of these cases, the proofs uh, often are simply a series of rewrites. But what the tool does is allow you to verify that these rewrites are being done in a sound way. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, then I'm just curious why you didn't work with an easy crypt. Oh, uh, because easy, uh, what this tool allows us to do is this automated. Um, so you could have included that. This is actually a, uh, a avenue for further research, which we have going for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank. Uh, let's thank you. Uh,